Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. My name is Bhavna. I'm a medical registrar and I work in the NHS. Um, for today's session, we've got two parts. Um, one, I'll go through OET speaking and the clinical communication skills, which are essential on the OET speaking. And then we'll have Dr. Siddharth Rana, who is a GP trainee, also working in the NHS who will be joining us and telling us a little about uh, GPs in the NHS, how we um, write a letter to a GP um, in OAT writing, and uh, what exactly is needed to become a GP in the NHS. All right, so I'll start with my session now. Um, in case you have any questions, the question bar is open. Um, I'll go through all the questions and answer them at the end of my session. And if you have any questions for Dr. Rana, you can do that um, after his session. All right. Okay. Now, the learning objectives for this small session is to identify various clinical communication criteria assessed in the OED speaking. Guys, if you can just go through your handouts. Uh, I've given you two handouts today. One is uh, are the OED speaking criteria according to the new OED guidelines. So that will show you the linguistic criteria and the clinical communication criteria required on the OED um, speaking. Um, then we'll go through each criteria and how we can use simple measures to increase our speaking scores. Uh, we'll try and identify certain uh, features which are very specific for people failing their OAT speaking. And we'll try and increase our OAT speaking score based on this lecture. All right. So this is what the official OAT site gives you. These are the clinical communication criteria which are assessed on OAT speaking. Um, just remember that the OAT speaking are two short scenarios. Um, there was um, there was a question in the beginning of the um, session by by Akash. So Akash actually, so Akash has asked um, that he wants to know um, what happens in the exam in the speaking component and uh, whether he's going to play the role of a doctor and a patient and then the patient. Um, so Akash, actually, what happens on the OAT speaking? is that you have two sessions and the role that you play is specific to your profession. So if you're a doctor, you'll play the role of a doctor. If you're a nurse, you'll play the role of a nurse. If you are a dentist or a paramedic or a physiotherapist, you'll play your role accordingly. And the person who will be sitting in front of you will be a patient or a patient's relative. So in both of the sessions, you'll play your own professional role. That's why I like the OET speaking quite a lot, because it simulates what your life will be when you come and work in a foreign country. Um, there are two criteria by which your OET speaking is assessed. Um, that is the linguistic criteria, which is just language, grammar, using full sentences. And the second is the clinical communication criteria. We often find that when I test my students um, in OAT speaking, they practice the linguistic criteria quite a lot, but they don't really work on their clinical communication criteria. Through this session, we'll try and go through the clinical communication criteria in specific. What I also like about the OAT um, speaking is that it's very similar to what clinical communication criteria are used on your PLAP2 exams or on your CBT exams. So it's quite important that we try and build up our clinical communication skills at the first exam that you're giving towards coming and working in the UK or Australia or whatever foreign country you want to go to. All right. So as you can see on the official website, they give you five clinical communication criteria. Um, relationship building, understanding and incorporating the patient's perspective, providing structure, information gathering, and information giving. And then you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, um, they rated your clinical communication criteria from zero to three, where zero is ineffective use and three is adept use. Adept use means that you're using it like a competitive native speaker. 
um, guys just remember to pass you need to score at least two out of three on all the clinical communication criteria now I'll try and go through each of these in detail and then we go through a few tips and tricks which I give my students to try and enhance their speaking scores all right so relationship building um, so the OED speaking is a little strange in the sense that you have to walk into a room and then you see this stranger in front of you who's trying to uh, simulate being an, a patient or a patient's relative. So the beginning of this meeting is quite important. And what happens in the beginning of this meeting is what we call relationship building. So relationship building basically means uh, what it's defined on the official OAT side is the impact of your choice of opening to the conversation and demonstration of empathy and respect on your listeners comfort. So what I always find is um, when doctors or nurses who are very, very good doctors and nurses in their day to day life, they walk into the OAT speaking, they get extremely nervous. So what they do is um, they do not read their task properly. So they don't really understand who they're talking to right now. So if your task says that you're talking to a patient, remember to introduce yourself as the patient's doctor. Um, and then if your task is that you are uh, you are speaking to a patient's relative, then introduce yourself as a doctor for this patient's relative. I often find what people do and which is a very embarrassing mistake to make is that um, they go into a room and then they forget what their task was and then uh, they ask the patient's relative that how are you feeling today or how is your health. That's just really really embarrassing and if this was daily life you'll get lots of complaints against you and you'll be you'll be said to be a really bad doctor if you don't even know the person that you're trying to hold this conversation with. So try and introduce yourself to the patient or the patient's relative. Uh, a strategy which I like is um, you go into a room and then you say, hello, uh, my name is Dr. Bhavna Sharma. I'm the medical registrar in this um, hospital. Um, I understand you are Mrs. Smith, uh, Mr. Smith's daughter, am I right? So you can do something like that. Um, so what some people do is um, they introduce themselves. So I am Dr. Shah. Can I confirm your name and date of birth? So you can either do the first strategy or the second one. It just depends on you. I like the first strategy quite a lot because um, one, um, it sounds more professional. But if you don't know the patient's name, um, uh, uh, something that I advise students to do is uh, you go into a room, say, hello, my name is Dr. Sharma. I'm one of the doctors in this ward. Um, how may I address you? So how may I address you is quite good because in the sense they give you, uh, the patient will tell you, you can call me Mary or you can call me Sarita. So they give you a specific name and then throughout the conversation, you can call them Mary or you can call them Sarita. So it, it gets a little easy. Sometimes. Um, the patient might tell you, um, hello, uh, my name is Mr. William Johnson. So if they give you a full name, what you do is then you ask them, how may I address you today? So that gives you a sort of a way to fall back onto. And what I really like and what we recommend people to do on their PLAP2 and their MRCP paces is if you found the patient's name, then try and repeat the patient's name throughout your conversation. So it just creates a better relationship. Um, but if you forget the patient's name, don't use wrong names. I've, um, we've had some students making that mistake during their exam is um, they, they've been told a specific name and during the conversation, they sort of change the name of the patient. So you can note this down as well. Um, note the patient's name down and then go throughout the conversation repeating their uh, name again and again. Uh, all right, Mary, now we'll go through your clinical complaints. All right, Mary, let's talk about what your follow up would be. That just uh, gets your marks on relationship building up. Um, 
another thing that you can try and do is sometimes uh, this is a discharge conversation so the patient has already been in your care for the past week or past few days and the patient is getting discharged today then i would suggest um, trying and confirming their name hi uh, are you mrs smith hi mrs smith i can understand that you're getting discharged today rather than just putting an awkward start like mrs smith how are you today how may i help you that just sounds a little strange especially the patient is getting discharged so that's some strategies that we can use in relationship building guys make sure if this patient is in pain or has come to a and e with pain or any or they're very very unwell make sure at the beginning of your conversation you ask them that are you okay for us or you can use the sentence you might note this down as well you can ask them um, are you comfortable Should, can i proceed is there anything i can do to make you more comfortable um, especially not for this um, not for oet speaking in particular especially for the plap 2 exams when the doctors come in give the plap 2 exam it's very important that if the patient is in pain you try and solve that before you take the history of the patient so relationship building you can increase your score through it um, i also recommend that in the start highlight the purpose of the meeting so there's always a purpose for a meeting that would be your task so the task might be to discuss the patient's follow up or to take a brief history or to discuss a complaint so in the beginning when you're doing your relationship building you can try and mention to the patient that um, um, today we're going to discuss your impending discharge or today um, is the day that we're discharging you so we'll just go through uh, what happens next so that might be a little, little little things that you can do to build up your relationship building score one thing that i advise and people fail immediately when they do this is when they walk into a room uh, just introduce themselves and then start giving a lecture you need to give yourself the time to score on this category so you need to build up that initial conversation so make sure you do that it's very easy to do and it sets off your conversation in, on a right foot all right then the next um, clinical communication criteria is understanding and incorporating the patient's perspective. What it's defined on the official OAT site is it's the impact of how you fully involve the patient in the conversation on your listener's understanding and comfort. So what that means is I know uh, some of us are quite experienced doctors and experienced nurses, but what we need to remember is that we aren't the focus of the conversation this conversation is about the patient so you need to understand what the patient needs and you need to incorporate what the patient needs into your conversation something that i always try to teach my students is the concept of ideas concerns and expectations so idea what i so ideas concerns and expectations are the main focus of what every clinical communication should be so ideas concerns and expectations refer to what the patient needs all right so ideas is what the patient already knows concerns are what the patient is what the patient's main worries are or the what the patient's main concerns are and expectations are what the patient needs to be solved through this conversation so let's try and go through an example and try to clarify that concept for example um, i am a patient and i suffer from diabetes and this is a new diagnosis for me and um, i know a lot about diabetes um, um, i've read a lot about diabetes in a lot of journals because my father suffered from diabetes as well the problem with my diabetes is that my father died from diabetes complications um, because he wasn't able to get insulin on time expectations is that the doctor makes sure that he understands uh, my fears um, he knows um, that i know a lot about diabetes so i don't really need another lecture on diabetes 
and I need to make sure that the doctor knows that uh, my medications need to be arranged on time. So what would my ideas be and what would my concerns be and what would my expectations be? Guys, if you can just answer the same on the question bar and then we'll try and go through the concept of ideas, concerns and expectations. I'll give you two minutes. Excellent. So I've got lots of answers. So in this scenario, the patient's ideas are that they've already got a very good knowledge of diabetes. Um, their concerns are that one, their father suffered from diabetes, two, they died of diabetes, Th three, that they died of diabetes due to the fact that insulin wasn't available on time. And their expectations would be that you reassure them on arranging medications on time. So if you are a doctor or a nurse who's not aware of the ideas and concerns and expectations for this patient, you might walk into the room and give them a very long lecture on what diabetes is and how it affects your insulin levels and how it affects your sugar levels and what the complications might be. And that would be a waste of time, both for you as well as for the patient. So make sure that in the beginning, you're aware of what the patient knows, what they want and what they want from you. So that is the concept of ideas, concerns, and expectations. This is a concept which we use on, one, we use it on our OAT speaking. Two, we use it in our PLAB2 MRCP paces and in our CBT exams. Three, we use it in our daily life when we go and speak to every single patient or their relative. We need to be aware of ideas, concerns, and expectations audience awareness so audience awareness was a concept that we discussed yesterday as well um, audience awareness is basically understanding who you're speaking to so everybody's perspective will be different uh, depending upon who they are for example if there was a scenario when i was dealing with a patient who's dying and I had to speak to their relative. So we need to be aware that one, we're speaking to a patient's relative. Two, the needs of a relative will be very different from what the patient's needs might be. So the relative might be concerned about the patient's comfort. So they probably ask you about that. So just at the back of your mind, be aware of what your task is and what exactly they want to cover and what exactly the audience would need. And if I would flip that, um, for example, if you're a nurse and your conversation is with a doctor, if your conversation is with a doctor, then probably your language would be much more different um, than um, what it would be when you're speaking to another patient. So you'll try and modify your language depending upon who your audience is. 
Then comes the concept of sympathy and empathy. This is something that I'll cover in detail at the end of the lecture, and it's quite important that we cover this. All right, let's try and go to the next topic. Providing structure. This is extremely important, guys, because uh, when we did the poll in the beginning, most people said that they didn't like OET speaking because of the fact that it made them very, very nervous. Providing structure helps you deal with um, deal with your nervousness and your nerves on the exam. So we'll try and go through how we can make our life easier on the OET speaking by providing structure to our uh, speaking. All right. So what the official site says, uh, what providing structure actually means is that they say it's the impact of how you organize the information you provide and introduce new topics for discussion on your listeners understanding. What that basically means is that it shouldn't sound like you walk into a room and you give a lecture and then you walk out and nobody knows what you're talking about. What you need to do is when you do your OET speaking, you read your task, you'll see that the task is organized into chunks. So that means that you'll have a, a background, then you will have one thing to do, the second thing to do, the third thing to do, and the fourth thing to do. What I advise my students to do, that is that you organize your task into chunks of information. For example, in going back to the diabetes case, let's try and bring our nurses in at this point. For example, the nurse has a task. Um, uh, let's try and do something on blood transfusions. This is something that we did last week in our academy. So, for example, if a nurse, if we've got a scenario when you have a patient, um, the patient has come in after um, has come in due to an elective surgery admission. However, during the surgery, they developed a life-threatening bleed. Um, now they've dropped their uh, hemoglobin levels and um, they need urgent blood transfusion, but uh, the patient is refusing to get a blood transfusion done and they want to speak to the nurse in charge. And then your task is one, explain what a blood transfusion is to explain the method of blood transfusion three explain why the blood transfusion is necessary four answer the patient's questions so what i advise people to do is try and organize your thoughts into four parts okay so i have got this task i'm going to organize it into four portions so i'll divide my speaking into four portions in the first part, I'll introduce myself. I will uh, I will tell the patient that I'm going to speak to you about this blood transfusion. So I've given my relationship building. I've done that. Next, I have to explain the procedure for blood transfusion. So I'll just go through the medical uh, the medical facts in a good language. So I'll try and explain uh, what a blood transfusion is. With, with that, we use an IV cannula. We use aseptic precautions. That means I'm going to we minimize uh, chances of transmission of infections um, you I'll also explain something about cross matching and that we make sure that the blood transfusion is specific to the patient's blood group all right after that I'm going to talk about why this blood transfusion is needed in the patient because she's had that bleed and then uh, in the end once I've done all of that I'll I'll go to this part so when you make the notes when you make the notes for your task you can try and Put in one, two, three, four. So first, then you put in your notes for first part. Two, I'll put in my notes for the second part. Three, I'll put in my notes for the fourth part. So that's how I organize, organize my mind. And it also helps the patient also to understand what you're going through. Um, because if you go into a long lecture and you don't really divide your task, it becomes very difficult for the patient to understand. We need to know that it's very difficult um, patients aren't medically trained so whatever information that you're providing them might be very very new for them so it's very important that we divide the information into understandable chunks so that if the patient has any questions they can organize the thoughts in their mind as well one thing that 
we advise people to do is this is again an MRCP paces strategy uh, is that we signpost changes in subject. For example, if my task, for example, if you go if you go back to the blood transfusion task, the task had specific chunks. So one was explaining the procedure of the blood transfusion. The second was explaining the importance of blood transfusion. So what we can do is we can signpost at the beginning of my new paragraph or my new um, chunk is all right uh, mary now i'm just going to speak to you about the importance of blood transfusions all right mary now we'll just go through what a blood transfusion actually involves i'll just let you know about what the procedure of a blood transfusion is so this basically helps organize information in your mind and it helps bring down your nerves because you definitely know what's going to be done next. Another strategy uh, which we can use to provide structure is summarizing your information. Guys, this is extremely useful because this also helps you uh, score higher on your linguistic criteria. So what I tell my students to do is at the end of your task, you just summarize everything which you did during the task. All right, Mary. So today we discussed um, the need for blood transfusion in your case. I went through what briefly a blood transfusion involves and what precautions we take during a blood transfusion. We also went through what the complications of a blood transfusion are. I know you were a little concerned, for example, if the patient uh, asked you any questions about uh, whether they can catch HIV or whether they can catch infections. So then you can, uh, in your summary, include that. I understood that you were concerned about um, the possibility of transmission of HIV or other blood transmitted diseases. However, um, I, re I reassured you that the chances of this are very less because we screen all the bloods which we transfuse before for. Uh, infections transmitted through blood so this way what happens is that you tend to use a lot of full sentences and then uh, your examiner knows that one you provided structure two you cover whole of the task and because you used a lot of full sentences you're going to score very highly on your grammar so this these are a few strategies that we can use on our OET speaking to score higher all right, let's go to the next section, information gathering. Information gathering on the official OET website is defined as the impact of the questions you ask and how you listen to the responses on your listeners' understanding. Active listening. Guys, I often find that when people get very, very nervous, they stop listening to the patient. When we did our poll in the beginning, I especially included the question on nervousness. And most people said they do get very, very nervous on their OET speaking is even if you're very, very nervous, you still need to listen to your patient. I get I mean, it is very frustrating that people who are excellent doctors and excellent nurses, they forget basic nursing and basic medicine when they walk into OET speaking. You do this every single day of your life. Every single day, you have patients coming into you, you listen to their complaints, you listen to their histories, and you give them treatment. Don't forget that on your OET speaking. Make sure you're listening to your patient. One thing, please, guys, note that even if your task is different, they might ask you new questions during your speaking. So make sure your mind is open and you're actually listening to the patient. Do not use leading questions or compound questions. This is another strategy that will come in your PLAB 2 exams and your PACES and your CBT. You always use open-ended questions and then you go on to close-ended questions. What open-ended questions mean? Even in basic history taking, which all of us... Um, do uh, especially doctors when you do basic history taking you always go on from broader base questions for example um, you ask them how are you feeling broad question do you have any pain slightly narrower where is the pain more narrower 
is the pain in your lower abdomen so that's how you're moving from your broad questions to your narrow questions so um, that's something that we do do in information gathering but i won't really be very very concerned about that what i would be concerned about is using compound questions what happens is that we've got a lot of knowledge and we try and show that knowledge on our OET speaking. But what we do sometimes is that we ask very, very complex questions. For example, um, uh, we had one doctor who was a very, very experienced cardiologist. And um, they were talking to this patient on OET speaking, mind you, not on MRCV basis, on a very basic English exam. Um, they started talking about, so this patient was someone who's, who had come in with an MI. And now this patient was getting discharged and the plan was to follow them up in the community for lifestyle measures so this doctor because she was a very experienced cardiologist um, she started asking the patient about history of mi and then uh, she started asking about very very complicated things like do you have shortness of breath do you have chest pain do you have uh, do you have orthopnea do you so she used all of those sentences as one so do you have shortness of breath do you have short uh, do you have orthopnea do you have um, chest pain so because this was three questions in one the patient might be really really bad to you and just answer yes but you don't know what they answered yes to so what i would advise is break up your questions into small parts so that this doesn't happen to you if you're a very, very experienced uh, cardiologist, they don't care on your OAT speaking. This is an English exam. This is not a med. Uh, this is not a medical exam. So using terms like orthopnea when the patient doesn't really understand what orthopnea is, is going to fail you. Um, moving on, clarify vague sentences. What vague sentences mean? For example, if the patient tells you, "Oh, doctor, I'm so worried." Oh, doctor, I think I'm going to die. So try and clarify that. Ask the patient, uh, why do you think so? Why, why did you say that? Is there a reason that you're worried about dying? So try and clarify these vague sentences. One, they'll build up your marks on information gathering. Two, you'll score marks for relationship building. Three, you'll score marks for sympathy and empathy because you're actually listening to the patient summarizing again will help you on your information gathering and help you score higher on information gathering all right information giving information giving um, is defined on the official oat site is the impact of how you provide information and check this information is being understood on your listeners comfort and understanding all of these points are repeated now ideas concerns and expectations tailoring your response to the patient's agenda clarifying the patient's questions please don't dodge the patient's questions often we have people that we try and practice the oat speaking with and then the patient says do you think i'm going to die doctor and the and the doctor dodges that question and then they move on to something else if the patient asks you something specifically, stop your lecture, clarify their question, and then move on. For example, if the patient tells you, doctor, am I going to die? One, you clarify that. Why do you think so? Is there a reason you ask that question? Doctor, I'm concerned because my father died of diabetes as well. Stop clarify i don't think in your case your diabetes is uncontrolled however by using good lifestyle measures and ensuring compliance to medications we should be able to prevent most complications of diabetes so that's how you answer the patient's questions and you scored marks on information giving again we come back to not using difficult language and medical terms guys terms which might be very very familiar to you like hemoglobin blood counts 
RBC, WBC, you find these to be very, very easy medical terms and you would say any anyone should know this, but that's not necessary. Patients are not medically trained. They might not understand basic medical terms. So what I advise is, for example, we coming back to the blood transfusion example for the nurse, we had a nurse who actually stated on the, her OET speaking is that your HB is very low. So then the patient came back to um, Dr. Watts HB. So that creates a very, very bad impression in front of the patient. Um, if and in front of your examiner, if you're using very difficult language or medical terms, one, it shows that you aren't really um, aren't, uh, aren't really tailoring your conversation to your patient. Second, um, if you would have used a simpler term, probably you would have scored higher on your linguistic criteria is because you were expanding that medical term into English. So what I advise people to do is if they find that they're using a medical term, which might be difficult, for example, um, when the nurse mentioned uh, that your HB is low, what she could have done is um, she could have uh, spoken like um, due to the fact that you had some bleeding after your blood transfusion, a marker in your blood test, which is called HB or hemoglobin, which is basically a marker of the level of blood or the level of red cells or your blood making cells in your body are now low so that is something that we need to correct so try and use simpler words for difficult medical terms and try and make your language easier that's going to score you quite highly on your linguistic and information giving criteria okay coming to the most important part of this lecture today is what exactly is sympathy empathy guys saying sorry a thousand times on your oed speaking is not going to make the examiner feel that you're the best and kindest doctor in the world what sympathy and empathy means is understanding the patient's condition and using that using their concerns in your management so if you are someone who listened to this patient's story about her father dying of diabetes you sh what you should do is you should use terms like i'm sorry to hear about your loss i understand your situation probably if i was in your shoes i would feel the same way do not do not use terms like i completely understand what you're going through for a patient who's got cancer because you don't really understand their situation what you can do is make your life easier by no please note down this sentence uh, the sentence is that if i was in your situation i would probably feel the same so that's an excellent sentence to use and it shows a lot of understanding on the part of the doctor or nurse for the patient's concerns. Um, going back to the blood transfusion example and the example of the nurse and the patient asking, doctor, do you think I can get HIV? I understand that I understand your concerns. This is an understandable concern. However, we'll make sure we make sure that you don't catch a blood transmitted infection by adopting all of these measures so trying and incorporating the patient's perspective rather than saying i'm sorry a thousand times makes more sense and it makes you sound like a better doctor and a most or a mo more sympathetic nurse or more empathetic nurse rather than repeating i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry because it tends to make you sound like a parrot you scored lower on your linguistic criteria and you look like a bad doctor or bad nurse all right in the end what what the take home message would be from this lecture is guys i've given you two handouts please download them the two pdf files so one is the official oet speaking criteria and it talks about all of the things that we've talked about today 
um, go through whichever sentences I've told you. We'll be uploading a YouTube video of the same lecture. So try and use the sentences that I've given you as a crux to make your own sentences, which you then use on your OET speaking and try and increasing your score. I've also given you a sample checking for the OAT speaking and um, try and use that and see if you're making the same mistakes on your OAT exam as well. Um, I would advise practicing with your colleagues OAT speaking. Try to use the templates that we've given you on your handouts and try and evaluate each other, score each other. Remember, you need to score two out of three at least in all the clinical communication criteria. The sentences I've given you, make some more sentences which you're more comfortable with and try and check the grammar before you use them in your exams. So you, your grammar sounds good and you sound more practiced and you sound less nervous. Sometimes we advise people to take professional speaking sessions. We can recommend the teacher speaking sessions, which are done with a doctor or a nurse, depending upon your profession and an English teacher as well. So that's quite good and something that we would recommend. Now what we'll do is I'll open uh, the floor to questions um, and then we'll get Dr. Siddharth on the line and he'll be discussing uh, with you what uh, GP in the UK means and how we uh, can tailor our practice to uh, including GPs in our clinical letters. Uh, while we're getting Dr. Siddharth on the line, we'll ask uh, people if they've got any questions. We do have lots of questions. And I'll try and uh, start answering them while we get Dr. Siddharth on the line. But if you have any more, you can just start. All right. Um, so Tehreem Zahid has asked, can you please tell me how to start a conversation? So Terim, we, um, we covered um, a basic start to a conversation, which was um, basically um, introducing yourself, uh, uh, saying your name. Hello, I am, for example, Terim, I can do one for you. So if, um, if Terim, you're going into a conversation, you can say hello. I am Terim Sahid. I'm a doctor and nurse working in this hospital. I understand you are Mrs. Smith. Mr. Smith's daughter, Let, uh, how can I help you today? Or you can say, I understand your father is very unwell. We're just going to have a discussion regarding the same today. Akash Kumar, I've already answered that question. He asked uh, two role plays where I act as a doctor each session lasting about five minutes. So Akash, it's not strictly five minutes. It's about five minutes, but it might extend to seven minutes. But you have two role plays where you're a doctor, depending upon whether you're a doctor or a nurse. Uzma has asked, can you repeat, pause, clarify patients' questions, example you gave, like diabetes? Um, so Uzma, what, we, um, what, what, what I mean by pauses is if a patient is highly emotional, for example, if a patient says, starts crying, or they say, doctor, I'm really scared that I might die, then even if you're talking, you stop, and then you say, I'm sorry you feel that way. Is there a reason you feel the same? So that's what I mean by pause and clarify. Um, Mr. Hamad Sheikh has asked, how should we end our conversation? So Hamad, you can either use the summarizing technique, where, which we covered, or um, you can use... Um, so we went through uh, so we went through this conversation do you have any questions which i can answer before we end so you can you can use that as well so those are two strategies which we can use to end our conversation sunita ladwani has asked is it necessary to summarize the whole role play sunita if you've got time then you can try and summarize the whole role play i covered what are the reasons which i recommend to summarize the role play Karez Namik has asked how to prepare for speaking part. Um, so Karez, um, the strategy which I gave you is you go through the OAT speaking criteria. You go through what is required on the OAT speaking criteria. 
and then you um, practice with your peers or you undergo professional speaking checks, which I recommend Teacher Academy. Naresh Kumar has asked, can you please explain again ideas, concerns, and expectations? All right, Naresh, let me give you another example. For example, if I'm a patient um, who's getting discharged after a heart attack, um, I've had a heart attack in the past, but then I was told it's something which I have to live with the whole life and nothing can really improve my condition. Um, my concerns are that I work as a professional athlete and I'm really scared as to, is it going to affect my career? And my expectations would be that if there is a follow-up or something that I can do to improve my life, can you help me with it? So my ideas would be my previous experiences with heart attack, what the previous doctors have told me about a heart attack. My concerns would be my career and my expectations would be trying and figuring out a follow up plan or a treatment for me. Sankar Raman has uh, asked how to end conversation, which we've already discussed. Ajit Raj has asked, does watching YouTube various speaking role play cards help in improving OET speaking? Ajit, we've made lots of YouTube videos where we practice with practicing GPs, practicing doctors and nurses, um, demonstrating an ideal speaking role play. So when you're preparing initially, especially when you're at the beginning and you think that you're failing a lot on your speaking, Trying and watching those YouTube videos might help, but I would recommend watching official OAT speaking role plays or teach your academy role plays rather than uh, rather than role plays which do not come from any reputed can uh, reputed uh, uh, academies because sometimes they put out wrong information. So Tehreem has given me an example and he says, can I start like, hi, my name is Dr. Tehreem. I'm one of the treating physician for today. How can I help you and what brings you here today? Tehreem, please uh, do not use this um, because one, you started with, hi, my name is Dr. Tehreem. That's fine. I'm one of the treating physician for today. This sentence doesn't really make any sense. Um, I would advise I'm one of the doctors today or I'm one of the doctors in the ward today or one of the doctors in clinic today. Treating physician isn't really a sensible uh, word or a phrase. How, what brings you here today? I would advise you against that. For example, if you're in a ward and the patient has been in the ward for seven days and you ask them what brings you here today, the patient is going to take your case because he's going to say, I didn't come here today and don't you know me all right so i would advise going against that terim i would advise using hi my name is dr terim i'm one of the if, if the patient is in the ward then you say i'm one of the doctors in the ward today um i'm here to discuss your discharge um before we start is there any way i can help you today or if the patient is in clinic and it's a new patient then you can definitely use, but you need to read your task. Aim. If you don't read your task, then you're going to mess this up if you memorize this. So what I would advise is if the patient is coming in a clinic, you can definitely ask what brings you here today, but please do not memorize this and use this for every single case that you get. Hema wants to ask, according to you, is it really difficult to score in speaking? Hema, um, the OAT exam isn't a difficult exam, but it is a tricky exam. If you don't know what's being asked, you're going to mess it up. So for everyone who's preparing for the OAT, I advise them to practice every single section separately because you're supposed to pass every single section. You should know what's important to know in speaking and what's exactly being asked in speaking. 
but if i was to compare the difficulty level of speaking versus writing definitely writing is more difficult but it varies from person to person some people they get very nervous during their speaking and then they mess up their linguistic criteria and the clinical communication criteria for them it is definitely very difficult to score in speaking devashish day wants to ask when i ask the patient's name is it mandatory devashish if the patient's name is given to you in the task you can tell them hi is that mrs smith hi is that anna so it's not necessary that you ask the patient's name but you definitely need to confirm the identity usma basis wants to ask how can we summarize the whole role play please repeat i missed that twice all right so usma the way that you summarize is that you go through the task and whatever the other main points that you discuss during the task so if you organize your task into different chunks um let's go back to um, let's give you a new example um this is similar to what happens on the plap 2 exam is um, you have this session where this patient has got a heart attack and they are being discharged and they are also informed about a wrong diagnosis which was made during their previous ane admission so when you try and summarize this um in at the end then you say that uh, all right just to summarize our whole uh, discussion um we first went through what your plan for discharge is we went through what your follow up would be from now on we discussed a little about the lifestyle modifications that we could make um we also discussed the wrong diagnosis for a heart attack which was made on your previous ane admission and we told you about some measures that we will take in the future to prevent this from happening so summary is very very brief and it's just the main points that you covered on your speaking task bakar adam wants to ask in sympathy is it bad to say i can understand your situation but i what i would say that if the patient has got a very complex diagnosis like they've got advanced cancer or um, or multiple um, sclerosis or a brain tumor um then um, it it can be a little in, uh, insensitive or a little inappropriate to say i can understand your situation um what you can do is i can you can say please note the sentence down um uh, it's i can only imagine the situation you're in probably if i was in your situation i would feel the same so i'll repeat that sentence is i can only imagine the situation that you're in if i was in your shoes or if i was in your situation i would probably feel the same um let me just we'll just pause answering the questions and i'll just clarify whether dr siddharth is online now Hello, everyone. Sorry, I'm just cross-checking whether I'm on the screen or not. Hi, Dr. Siddharth. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Pavna. How are you? Am I am I audible and am I visible to everyone? Hello. All right. Seems there's some teething issues there. Um, so, Dr. Siddharth. There. Yeah. Hello. 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 Hi, Siddharth. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. 
All right. Um, so Dr. Siddharth is one of our GP trainees. He's working in the NHS. Dr. Siddharth, would you like to introduce her? Yes, so um, um, I'm one of the GP trainees working in uh, northeast of England. Uh, currently, I'm in uh, second year of my training. Um, and I'm here to ask and tell you anything uh, you would want to know about GP training. Uh, and just to clarify a few doubts you might have in terms of uh, OET prep, in terms of primary care or the letters you might have to write for that. All right, that's very good. Thanks, Dr. Siddharth, for joining us again. Um, what our students often struggle with is uh, when they're writing a letter to a GP on their OET writing, they don't really understand what they need to include in that letter. Mm -hmm. So can you just tell them a little about primary care and what a role of a GP is and what you want in a letter that specialist or secondary care sends to you? Right, um, well, to, to kind of understand that, it's more important to understand who is receiving that letter and where the letter is coming from. So essentially, um, the role of the GP is important to understand in this. Um, now, if you was to correlate what a GP does in NHS, it's almost like um, having a family doctor uh, or a doctor who knows you from right till you were born, uh, till you would die. So this would be a doctor who would have the continuity of care and would know about you. Um, now to understand that, uh, let me give you an example. So if I had a child, um, I would uh, register that child with a local GP. Um, that might be the same GP I am registered with or uh, whoever happens to be in the local area. Uh, now this GP would know about bits and bobs which would happen with my child right through the time this child dies. Um, or if the child moves out of the area and gets registered with a GP who is local to that area. So say if my child moves to some other city, uh, the GP who would be in that city would uh, take over this child as his patient um, and would take over the continuity of care. Uh, now, when we receive letters from uh, secondary care or specialists in hospitals, uh, we like to know what has happened in that short time they are in hospital. Um, we don't want to know everything what happened in that short time they were in hospital. We don't want to know um, what happened when they entered the hospital, how many medicines you gave them, what was the dose of the medicine, what uh, frequency you gave the medicine for, how fast you gave the IV infusion, uh, when they became sick, which day, what, we don't want the details. We want a synopsis, we want a summary of how things went um, so that if something needs to change when they're outside the hospital in the continuity of care, uh, we would make those changes and make sure that that thing follows up and things are changed uh, in future. Um, so that's that's the role of the GP in terms of probably the letters and the communication you would have in OET exams, uh, knowing that there's a person who knows the background, who knows uh, how to put things in uh, sort of this mosaic of a picture, um, and you have to communicate those small bits to them, um, and not the whole picture, which you might think is more important, but for us there's a greater picture in the background uh, and you just need to put uh, you just need to put a uh, few points in there in terms of what needs to change. So that's essentially the role of GP, um, um, giving a continuity of care, um, and for your sake, giving us a small picture of what has happened with them. All right, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, can you just also let our audience know about what exactly a career in the UK is and how you can get through to becoming a GP? And right. what your so, as well. Right. Um, so uh, in terms of becoming a GP, um, like any other speciality uh, in UK, uh, you have to get through a training program. Um, that's the usual route of becoming any kind of specialist, whether it's a GP or whether it's a hospital consultant. Um, if you want to become a hospital consultant, uh, there is an alternative uh, route, which is called a CESA route, wherein you could prove that you're competent enough uh, in terms of uh, your postgraduate degree or postgraduate specialization you might have done in your own country. Um, and you can prove to the GMC by different paperwork um, um, and say, well, my training and my experience is good enough uh, and hence uh, I should be given a registration as a specialist. 
However, for uh, general practice, uh, this kind of uh, alternative route is a bit tricky uh, and it's usually not possible for anyone outside uh, EU uh, just because how the training is in other countries. For example, uh, the country I was, uh, I graduated from uh, was India and there is nothing like a route um, that I was aware of. Uh, probably there might be new routes coming up uh, nowadays, but at the time there was nothing like a specialization in general practice. You couldn't uh, just say, oh, I was a general practitioner in India and I can be, can I be a general practitioner in the UK? So for all practical purposes in the UK, you have to do a, a, a training program, a, a specialization program. Um, and like any other job, you have to apply for it. Um, and the way you apply is, web, well, it's open competition. Um, and you apply via a website called Oriel. Now that's a common website for all the training um, applications in the UK. Um, and the best source of information like what and how and when to apply, what's the prerequisites, what's the essential documents um, you need before you apply, uh, those all can be found on the National Recruitment website. Um, and for GP National Recruitment, uh, all the information is on website which goes by GPNRO. Um, so if you Google GPNRO UK, uh, you would get this website um, and you would get all the information you need in terms of the essential documents, the time scales, um, and you just need to make sure you have all those tick boxes uh, before you apply. All right, thank you. Um, I think Dr. Uh, Ozma has a question. Mm -hmm. I heard we can skip FY1 if we've done our internship, but for getting into FY2, we need a very high score in OET like A grade or A band in IELTS. So what will happen for my FY2? So you can speak to them about skipping FY2. Right, um, so um, any kind of job, whether it's a GP or uh, it's a, a training job or a non-training job, you don't need any kind of F1 or F2 or any kind of experience. Uh, what you need to prove is that, are you having um, a permanent registration with, you, uh, with the GMC? If you have a provisional registration with the GMC, then you can't take jobs which a permanent registration doctor does, essentially the jobs of a higher specialty training uh, or jobs of SD1 um, and F5-2. So um, if you have provisional registration, you can't do those jobs. If you have permanent registration, you can do any job. You can do F1, F2, anything. Um, now, the option of skipping F5-1, yes, you can skip F5-1 if you have permanent registration. And it just depends on whether you want to skip that F5-1 level job. For all practical purposes, as the job market stands now, uh, you'll have to skip FY1. Um, the reason being, the number of jobs there are in FY1 level are exactly the same number of medical school positions. So say if the whole country has 1,000 places in medical school, the total number of FY1 jobs will be 1,000 as well because that's the obligation for the medical schools and the NHS that they have to train the doctors who they have in their MBBS or the graduation system. Uh, so on for you to get an FY1 job, someone has to drop out or uh, an MBBS or graduate student has to say, well, I don't want to do medicine or he should fail the exam. Something like that needs to happen for you to have that job vacancy. So for all practical purposes, you would have to skip FY1. You wouldn't have that option to do FY1 uh, unless those things happen. Um, and yes, you can skip it. That's what everyone usually does um, because your internship, what you're doing in your own countries or your um, uh, work experience, what you do after your um, well, five years or four and a half years of medical school is what is FY1 here. Um, so if you have your internship and those kind of things from your home countries, uh, then you can skip FY1, go to FY2 or any other job. And then from there on, you could choose to stay in that route of working for hospitals and NHS organizations, or you could uh, want, uh, want to sort of uh, specialize and get some qualifications and uh, choose to work for Health Education England. You're working in, in the same hospital essentially, but you're, work, you're being employed by Health Education England and you are training, i.e. you are doing some portfolio works, you're doing some exams apart from your job. Um, so you can very well skip FY1. Um, the only thing you would need uh, is, say, if you're applying for specialty jobs, i.e. if you're wanting to train, if you're wanting to work for HEE, 
then you might have to uh, submit what is called an alternate certi certificate of foundation competency. Uh, now that is something which is kind of a barrier, i.e. if you want to do something which is a specialization job, you need to prove that you have internship certificate. Now, your internship certificate in India is valid for your GMC registration, but it's not valid for the specialist trainings. Uh, so you need a form which says your internship was good enough or is equivalent to UK foundation training. Um, and every specialty training wants this form signed in a different way. Um, for example, um, pediatric training, when I was applying for these programs, did not want this form to be signed by a doctor outside of UK. So you could ask your um, seniors in your own um, countries to sign this form for any other specialties. For example, in GP, you could get this form signed by your seniors in your own countries, but for pediatrics, it was not allowed. So these things keep on changing um, and you would need this form when you apply for the specialty training programs, whether it's GP or any other specialty. And again, the information would be on um, for all these niche specialities, including GP, uh, it would be on their own recruitment websites in details. For example, in GP, that's the GP NRO. All right, um, so Akash has asked, what's the best time to apply for training? Um, so the, uh, there won't be a uh, straight away answer, uh, one answer for that. Uh, it just depends on your own situation. Um, as I said, the job is not different. Uh, so if you're working in medicine, you would be working in the same way uh, in terms of training. So training is not different to any other job in NHS. Uh, what is different is with training comes extra commitments and extra responsibilities. Uh, you have to do, as I said, exams, um, which are dependent on what training you're doing. So for example, for medicine, it'll be MRCP. For a psychiatry, it would be MRC Psych. For GP, it will be MRC GP. So you would be doing those exams, which is on top of your day-to-day -day job where you'll be going to work, seeing patients, coming back, uh, and those kind of things. So that's an extra commitment. Apart from that, every speciality would have their own way of proving competencies. For example, in GP, uh, we have a portfolio, which, well, most of the uh, specialties have portfolio, but um, every specialty has a different kind of uh, prerequisites, sort of different kinds of things you need to do on your portfolio. Uh, portfolio, uh, if uh, you don't know, is something which we have in terms of um, a logbook. Uh, it's an online logbook wherein we put entries, we type stuff, um, and if it is GP, we type stuff about predominantly reflections. So we write um, around, say, a couple of paragraphs about how things went in a particular patient, how we felt about it, and what changes we are going to bring in. Um, and these reflective entries take time. Uh, they take uh, thinking what you want to reflect on because you can't just reflect on everything. You can't just say, well, I saw a patient with a um, fungal infection of the nail. Uh, I gave him antifungal and the fungal infection became better. I felt good about it. That's not reflection. Uh, it needs to be more in depth. So when you do these kind of things, it takes time um, and you might have to do them at your own time. Um, and these extra commitments, uh, exams, reflections or portfolio work, uh, takes time and if you think you're comfortable in your job and you can do these extra commitments whilst you're working then it's fine you can apply for training straight away if you think you want to settle down in UK know where you want to be um, become comfortable in everything else like for example I imagine like most of you who are hearing me are international medical graduates um, if you think you would want to settle first i.e know where to buy your grocery form, know how to pay uh, rent, how to pay a mortgage, buy a house, and those kind of things. Like, it, like job is important, but other things in life are also important, if not more. Uh, so if you want to settle down first and deal with other issues and feel comfortable in your life in the UK, um, then that's fine as well. You can work, I take away the responsibility of doing exams and uh, portfolio work work in NHS hospitals for uh, however long you want to work and then apply for training. So it would be different for everyone. Um, if you want to apply for training, you just need to know what is the essential documents you need before applying for that particular training and apply for it if you want to choose that. All right, thank you. Raghav Gandhi has asked, can you say the name of the form and where can I find the form? I think he means the FY2 form. Uh, 
Um, so alternate certificate of foundation competency. Uh, again, this document might be different for different specialties. Um, say if you have a speciality in mind, uh, then you could go on um, the NRO websites, which is speciality specific. So medicine has their own website, um, GP has its own website. So you could go on these websites and find this document there. Uh, alternative would be to go on Oriel, uh, and in Oriel there is a, a document page. So if you type in Google, um, Oriel, H-E-E, -E, um, and so that's, this website would come up. And in the document um, folder, you would find um, alternate certificate of foundation competency. Um, and it changes every year because rules keep on changing in the UK every year in terms of applying for speciality training. So it's always ideal to go on this website rather than me sending you a document now because it might not be the same document in six months time. Um, so go on this website, um, Oriel, which has all the documents for every specialty or specialty specific websites um, to find this document, which is the updated document. All right. Hema has asked, I'm an ophthalmologist and I've got MSc from UK, fellowship from Europe, and I work in NHS as a specialist. Which route should I follow? Um, so for ophthalmology, I'm not quite sure what the uh, route of training is. Uh, so I would be mistaken if I said anything. Um, if I was to comment, I think it's the same route uh, in terms of initial bits so that you have to apply in Oriel and then you have to give uh, SRA exam. Um, but I would check uh, ophthalmology um, um, training website for that. Um, or Oriel is a very good resource. So there would be a, a two windows, uh, one for sure, because most of the speciality take intake in August. So I would check around, um, well, I think the August window is already gone for this year, uh, but I would still go on Oriel because you could still see the applications which have closed and see what the prerequisites were. Um, and to make an account on Oriel is very simple. You just make an account like any other website, uh, email, password, and you're just in there. Uh, and I would see what the prerequisites are before you apply for those jobs. Um, if I heard the question right, you are an international medical graduate. Um, so with ophthalmology or any other speciality, um, it ultimately boils down to the competition ratio. Uh, and I might be uh, wrong, but I think the competition ratio for ophthalmology is quite steep. Um, and hence, I don't know how easy it is to get in. So if there is an alternative way to get alternate certificates or CESA route in ophthalmology, probably that might be better. Uh, but with the current visa situation, wherein people are able to apply in round one, probably it's not as difficult as I am saying it is. Um, so I would check Oriel website uh, and see what what's what uh, in terms of the prerequisites required. Right, that's it for questions for now. Dr. Siddharth, thank you so much for joining us. That's right. You've helped a lot and you've answered a lot of questions. So hopefully we we'll get lots of people following you now. Oh, great. My pleasure. All right, thanks. Bye-bye. Nice talking to you, everyone. All right, um, so what we'll do, we'll try and cover the questions which were left now. If everyone can hear me, can you please type in yes, and then we'll just go through the last of our questions. Excellent. Um, we've got some more questions which were left um, on OAT, uh, on the OAT speaking. Guys, if you have any questions regarding people for the internal medicine pathway, I'm happy to answer them. But we'll try and do that at the end because we've got a lot of nurses uh, who've joined us as well. So we want them to get covered first before we try and narrow down to doctors. All right. So... Sunita Ladwani has asked, can you please tell me more about second role play involving carer, like how to start and end? 
Sunita, that's actually a very good question. And um, dealing with a patient's carer can sometimes be more difficult than dealing with the patient themselves. So what I advise you to do is um, first you'd never, never in starting a conversation with a carer, um, ask them how their health is. Um, you can ask them that, um, for example, if you're dealing with a patient and their daughter, if you're speaking to a daughter regarding a dying father, what you can do is you can start out with, hi, is that Anna, Mrs. Shah's daughter? Um, Anna, how are you today? I know things aren't going that well for your father, so we'll try and have a conversation about it today. So that's how you can start. You can give them a brief background as to why their conversation started, and then we can try and build up on that, uh, the brief um, questions uh, that you've answered in the beginning and try and answer them throughout the conversation as well. Um, in the end, you can say, I'm sorry that I'm not bringing you much good news about your father, but we're doing our best to help him out and we'll try and make him as comfortable as possible. Guys, if you want to note out these sentences, it should be fine. So we'll try. Uh, we're trying to make your father as comfortable as possible. Um, but if you need anything, you can let us know. Something that you can also do, especially if you're dealing with a carer and you know that they're very, very stressed, um, just for relationship building, you can tell them that um, I know um, it's a difficult situation for everyone, but it would be it would be good if you also have some rest or probably get some more family members around just to help you out as well. So both of all these things they show a lot of empathy and a lot of sympathy, and they also show that as a as a doctor or as a nurse you care about um, you care about the patients um, as well as their carer Uzma Basit wants to ask I'm very much scared about speaking I feel so nervous whenever I practice please give me some advice so Uzma um, I keep reminding everyone that you do this every day um, you this is this is your life as a nurse or as a doctor so please do not feel that what you're doing on the OET speaking is very very different or it's something that you should be scared about if you want to come and work in the UK and if you want to come and work in the NHS you need to do this every single day of your life and this OET speaking is not even medicine it's just English so being scared is not logical Yes, it can be sometimes nerve. Uh, it can sometimes make you nervous. The fact that your English is being evaluated by someone else. But if you practice just your English and understand that this is my life in the future, I need to work on this. Your nerves should start going down. If you practice with your colleagues, try and practice with lots of people. Don't just practice with one person who's your friend. Try and practice with multiple colleagues with different accents um, to try and work on your nervousness. Um, you can do professional uh, speaking sessions. You can do some with Teacher Academy where you try and get it done with nurses and doctors as well as English teachers so that if you've got evaluated in a mock test, your nerves do go down. We try to make our lectures quite difficult at teacher, especially when we're doing speaking sessions to bring down your nerves as well. Raghav Gandhi has asked, in summary, do we have to repeat each and every advice or just headings like precautions and treatment? Raghav, I would advise that in your summary, you include just your headings and the most important take home message that you want your patient to know. Uzma has asked, reading is the most difficult part. Can you give some tips on it? Uzma will try and do some lectures on reading separately. Um, just to cover reading because it's a very, very broad topic, but practice is the essence of each and every section on the OET. Hamad has asked, uh, Mohammed Hamad Sheikh has asked, 
what internship awards are important for applying for internal medicine programs training and non training both um how much you need to have basic uh, medicine experience which is about two two months experience in medicine um to apply for fy1 and um if you want to apply for sho level post sho level basically means house officer post um then you need to have at least two years experience in internal medicine sunita ladwani has asked please repeat ending sentence um so sunita if you were talking about the carer um then you can use a sentence like um, thank you for speaking to me today i understand that it's a difficult situation for you and your family we're trying our level best to help out your father we'll try and make him as comfortable as possible but as his carer you also need to take some rest and maintain your strength uzma has asked can you give me some tips on improving my vocabulary and grammar um usma try to go on our website and go through the basic um, vocabulary and grammar topics that we've advised um you can go to our youtube channel and you can go through my vocabulary and uh, grammar tips which i gave for the writing section uh, particularly for the speaking section uh, using sentences which i've told you throughout this uh, lecture as well as trying and making uh, try and make sentence uh, sentences of your own um especially for the end and beginning and for your summary should help you out in building up your vocabulary and grammar for the speaking section usma has asked what is the name of your youtube channel usma it's uh, teacher academy we'll send you a link as well all right so guys that was the last of our questions i'll give you a minute or two in case anyone has any remaining questions and then we'll wrap up the session for today please go through the handouts that we've given you they're quite useful they're the oet um, speaking criteria as well as a sample of our speaking check All right so we'll wrap up our session for today um thank you guys for joining us um in case of any inquiries you can contact the phone number which is provided on the screen our youtube channel if you search teach your academy on youtube um it should send you to our channel um and you can check out our website as well um the website name which we mentioned for training was health education england so if you um if you google health education england or oriel which is o r i e l that's oriel it should bring you to the training page hansa devi wants to ask that she wanted to know what to write in a referral letter if a patient has been referred for a specialist So Hansa we covered all of this in our previous lecture on writing so if you go to our YouTube channel you'll be able to see our live session and it shows all of the information which are necessary when a patient is being referred to a specialist All right so that's the session for today I hope you guys enjoyed the session and you got a little bit of background on what working in the UK is and um, how we deal with different specialities in the uk and the importance of clinical communication on the oet speaking and how you can use it for your plap 2 mrcp paces your cbt training as well as when you come and work with us in the nhs good luck everyone